Yes. Sorry, I broke my femur, so you can see how how much I wanted to do this panel. <laughs> we appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the panel on pushing past growth barriers in Web3. Uh, let's kick it off with intros from our panel. Um, did you want to go first, Matt? Uh, sure. I'm back there. Can you hear me? OK, awesome. Uh, I'm Matt Galgan, co-founder of XMTP, and the company behind it, uh, Ephemera, formerly known as XMTP Labs. Word soup. Uh, we're building a uh, secure, uh, decentralized messaging protocol for uh, for the world, uh, but starting with Web3. And uh, yeah, we've been around since uh, 2021, and it's integrated into Coinbase Wallet and a number of other places, but we uh, want to bring better messaging to the world. Justin? Hey everyone, I'm Justin, co-founder of Safari. Uh, Safari began as the first community of Web3 growth leaders. Actually, four of the five panelists that were on this stage right beforehand are all Safari members. Um, and then since then, we've built the leading platform for identifying and engaging your best crypto users um, and driving them through the funnel. Definitely. Hi, everyone. Ooh, testing. Yeah. Hello. There we go. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Declan Fox. I'm the product lead at Linear. Uh, our mission at Linear is essentially to build better networks, to kind of empower people and communities to have more economic and political agency. Uh, we built a ZK EVM layer two. It's now one of the biggest layer two roll-ups on Ethereum. Um, and we're also part of the company from Metamask with Consensus. Thank you, Sandy. Hi, I'm Sandy Carter. I am the COO of a company called Unstoppable Domains. Do you guys know it? Um, we're a digital identity platform, and I'm also the founder of a group called Unstoppable Women of Web3 and AI. So, and I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you for having me. Oh, and we're a user of XT XMTP. I have not met you in person. This is great. Excellent. So first, uh, to start off with, if you can share some of the most significant challenges that you've experienced, significant world challenges, and how have you addressed them? Anybody want to kick it off? Sandy? Yeah, so, um, so we do digital identity. And one of the biggest challenges was trying to explain the power of digital identity through a domain. And so what we kept trying to do is to bring our value proposition um, and have Web2 users come over to us. And we decided that it was really too hard for them. And so what we started doing recently is tokenizing or placing on chain.com. So instead of having them come to us, uh, we're going to the Web2 users. And so what this means is that like, if you have sandy.com, that can now be your digital identity. It exists as a DNS domain, which means it works with all Google uh, browsers and Microsoft browsers. But it also lives on chain. So that means you could use sandy.com as your wallet address. Um, you could use it as your, your email address. You could use it to log into decentralized applications. Um, and through that, we're seeing a lot of Web2 users who are having that aha moment. Um, and I would say the second thing that I love about this is building on chain. We've also noticed that using terminology Web3, for some reason, it's confusing. When you say on chain, it's almost like before, you know, how you had online. It was on hyphen line until everybody got it, and then it became online. Um, and we're seeing now, too, just bringing .com on chain, talking about it that way, showcases the value proposition and the value that it brings. So we're seeing a lot more people want to use it. So we, those are our two biggest challenges and how we've been addressing them. Well, I think first things first is talk to folks that aren't using these technologies today and understand why they're not using it. What's the thing they're getting stuck on? And when you go back to the history of this space and we look at the kinds of things that we used to say as the taglines, like not your keys, not your crypto, and all these things, it was kind of a, uh, an off-putting uh, experience for folks that were in the out group, right? Those of us in the in group, well, we know how to do this stuff. It's just, uh, we learned it, it's natural, we're early, whatever. And what that sort of created was this situation where 
uh, those that were in on it basically said, well, they've got to come to us. They've got to learn it. We're the ones providing all this wonderful benefit here, and the world will, you know, learn Web3 when the world comes to Web3. And so, you know, then that's great. But when I talk to my mom and I say, hey, you know, you want to sign up for this, uh, you know, thing that I'm, I'm doing, and I have to go through seed phrases and Lord knows what else, it's like, cool, do we think that there's value in this space? Uh, to people that are not already a part of the group. Um, yes, nobody else raised their hand, so I guess you don't believe in the value of the space. Uh, let's pack up Shep. Let's do um, there's tons of value here. There's so much to be done. There's so much to be gained, but we have to meet them where they are, just like, like Sandy had said, and we have to completely rethink the way these experiences, uh, you know, that we show up to these experiences. So it's smart wallets and pass keys and and phone numbers to sign up as opposed to always thinking that, uh, you know, we know best and you should know your keys and all of those things. You have to adopt to us. <laughs> What's that? You have to adopt to us. We... Totally, yes. totally. Uh, we, we, we have to meet them where they are now. And yeah. it's just, otherwise we're, we're stuck. Yeah, exactly. Justin? I think that there are two. Uh, for me, there is one uh, sort of the lack of the, the macro narrative um, in crypto today. Um, in 2021, when I got into the space, there was this really compelling narrative of disrupting intermediaries that I think brought a lot of people to crypto from uh, their powerful sort of these intermediaries in every industry, uh, from TradFi to music to academia. And that brought in new spaces like D DSI and all these other things that people saw the sort of an optimistic future that could be built with crypto. And I think that we've come a far ways away from that in the last three years, um, that there, we're really lacking this uh, broader optimistic future that is being pushed by people that are in, in the industry. And that was really attractive to people like me who joined in, in the last cycle. And so I think that that's on the most, like the highest level, I think that's one of the biggest barriers to us increasing user adoption and bringing more people into the space at the top of the funnel. And then the second one, which is more dear to home for us um, in Safari, is I think that growth leaders are the ones driving growth often in, these, uh, in their individual companies, but they often lack the support that they need to actually do their jobs. Um, and so in the Safari side, we see ourselves on the community, but also on the tooling side, as giving them the support that they need to grow. Um, and this is not just uh, grow, in the, grow in their companies, but grow in their careers as well. Growth leaders need more support from their founders in terms of getting resources and budget, being having their dev teams build out the technical foundations for them to be able to grow, um, and getting peer-to-peer -peer support from each other of really facing the, the unique challenges that the growth leaders face. So um, our community, I'd say, is a little bit like a therapy session for a lot of growth leaders, um, and that's the, that's the way that it is. But we need more yeah. of them. Yeah, but they need that. Declan, you want to add anything? Yeah, I think one of the biggest problems for us with growth has been identifying real users. Obviously, blockchains are pseudonymous, and you sort of see an on-chain address, and you see lots of users and lots of transactions or lots of addresses, but you're like, how many actual real users are there beneath this? Obviously, you get people trying to Sybil protocols, and in some ways, some applications and networks kind of play into that. So for us, it's really been about trying to kind of tease who are those real users, what do they want, what are they trying to do, and how can we build products that actually enrich their lives? Um, and the kind of way that we try to, at least for today, solve that problem is leaning into these uh, identity and reputation primitives. And so we actually uh, helped to bootstrap uh, a primitive called Verax at Linear. It's an open source community. It's got lots of contributors from the ecosystem. And it's really sort of a core primitive that allows you to issue attestations and then consume them. And this is a sort of a better way to actually start to build up these social graphs and reputation infrastructures to identify real users on the blockchain. Um, even ourselves at Linear, we've used Verax for our, for our own uh, proof of humanity protocol. Okay, so we're actually able to sort of build up a way to say, yes, this address is actually a real person, and it kind of removes the idea of Sybil. So if someone has a hundred thousands, tens of thousands of addresses, for us, we at least sort of still count it as like one individual person. And then we can look at that activity and start to understand how, how might we build better products that kind of like lead to a more sustainable ecosystem. Excellent. So Matt, you mentioned user education a little bit a while ago as well. So if we put that on stage now, user education. <laughs> Any, uh, first of all, how important is that? And any initiatives that you've worked on that you can highlight that have been have really worked and as well, how much work needs to be done in user education? Yeah, I think 
user education is a collaborative effort. It is not a, we're going to come up with this thing and we're gonna educate you and we're gonna teach you how this thing is done and expect that you're gonna get any results. I think some of the best learning that we've had uh, in our experience in building with messaging is standing with someone and watching very painfully as they go through the whole process of whatever it is that you're trying to do. Whether that is you're building a dev tool and you watch as they you know, fire up their terminal and you know, try to you know, get your CI going, or uh, CLI, sorry, uh, or it is you know, opening up your app for the very first time and watching each one of those screens as they pass. And there's so much that can be learned in just those few moments, 60 seconds with, with one user, two users, 10 users, can teach you so much more about what your deficiencies are, what you need to change, and then you get the opportunity to take those learnings and put them back into the product and then find ways to sort of guide somebody. No amount of tutorials or pop-ups or anything is ever gonna help someone get to that aha moment. The only thing that gets you there is by spending that time to really truly learn what that, what that thing is, what that magic moment is that gets them over that hump. And some fun too, like the earlier panel said. I think user education needs some fun too. <laughs> fun, Sandy yes, too. pain, yes. Was, but also fun. <laughs> yes, it needs to be fun. Sandy? Yeah, I would say um, one of the things that we like to do is customize for the community that we're actually helping educate. And so let me give you a couple of examples. So uh, this morning we were on stage with Pudgy Penguins. Do you guys know Pudgy Penguins? Um, and so we really customized how we taught them how to use their own digital identity on chain for what works with Pudgy Penguins. So Pudgy Penguins does a lot of storytelling. So we did more storytelling. They live in Discord. And so we try to meet them in Discord. Um, and I contrast that with the way we try to educate. We did a, a dot Austin for the city of Austin. Uh, and those are citizens of the of the city of Austin, right? So there's citizens that live there and they basically had no discord, no like what normal way we would say that we would educate. And so what we did there is we went into some of the community colleges to educate them because that's where they got their learning. The citizens are looking for learning there. So I think trying to get to where the community lives and how they are typically educated really helps. Um, and then the second thing is, I started this group called Unstoppable Women of Web3 and AI. Um, and I did that because uh, there's a big bro culture here in Web3. And um, one of the things that we found is that women learn better when they can ask all kinds of questions. Um, some of the questions they feel are stupid questions, but everybody has them, but they don't wanna ask them in a big mixed group. So we've trained 55,000 women um, in this space, and one of the number one things they say is that because it's a, a group of women that they're working with, small groups, they can ask any question, uh, whether they feel it's stupid or not stupid, that it really helps them to learn uh, by doing and being able to ask others that are in that similar place. Just an um, I think for from my perspective, there's, there's two pieces where a little bit less like consumer facing on the Safari side, so I'll tackle where, where we're at. Um, one is on the, the marketer side, right? We, our mission is to onboard the next generation of great marketers into crypto. And so a lot of it, when we meet Web2 marketers, is talking about how we can accelerate their careers and bring them into the space and how Web3 marketing really represents a shift in the future of marketing. Um, and that's one way to bring a group, new group of builders and marketers who are largely non-technical also have largely non-technical friends into the space. Um, so that's on one area. I think sort of piggybacking off of what Mac, Matt was saying as well, I think that a lot of companies need to be a lot uh, stronger on the, their product funnels, uh, really understanding where users are dropping off at every point. I think that there's a lot of fuzziness to metrics in crypto today, um, and that, that drives a lot of like hand waviness that we don't need to realize where like consumers are actually dropping off. So I think that the, the more recognition of where consumers are actually dropping off in these like product experiences will drive builders to think harder about what we actually need to do to educate users at each step to keep them um, in products and driving them towards the actions that we care about. Declan, anything to add? Yeah, I, th I think for end users, I really imagine it similar to the web today where you don't really educate users on how to use Facebook. It's just so intuitive from a product experience perspective that you just know how to use it. So when it comes to end users, I'm actually of the belief that 
we should just build much better and intuitive user experiences to not have to educate. On the other hand, for builders, I think it's the complete opposite. And you know, I spend a lot of time with builders you know, developing apps on the linear, linear ecosystem. And quite often, I think, actually, the architectures that they're, that they're looking at are quite misguided. There's still like, a lot of educating to do to actually build better blockchain applications. You know, people come up to me and they say, hey, like, I've heard about layer 3s. I want to build a layer 3 on top of linear. And I'm kind of like, yeah, but do you really need like, a whole blockchain? Like, what's the actual purpose of that? Like, actually starting to think about ways to be really thoughtful about what goes on chain and what perhaps stays off chain. You know, Farcaster is a great case study of this, where actually most of Farcaster is not on the blockchain. They only use OP mainnet for like the actual identity and storage, like call it a hybrid app architecture or something. Most people don't even understand these kind of architectures to create better user experiences for like building blockchain apps. So for the, the developer side, for the builder side, there's still a lot of education, uh, in my opinion, that's needed. Now, in terms of partnerships, community-driven efforts, how can it help to drive uh, adoption and growth? And any, anything you look for with partnerships, what are key things you look for to create the best partnerships you can? Matt, did you want to? Sure. Uh, I think it's just empathizing with the users. Uh, it's that whatever thing that you're trying to sell, whatever the partnership might end up being, uh, it's the idea that Somewhere in the partner's side, they have their users, their users need to be served. And what is it that your particular contribution is going to bring to those users that's gonna get them excited uh, or get them interested or help that product along? Something that's like what XMTP is in messaging, it's, it's pretty natural in that sense where there's lots of capabilities that come along with communication that wasn't necessarily there before. Uh, but to take it the next step, means to actually understand the use case. It's not just that you can drop this SDK in and it's gonna magically work and everybody's gonna be happy. It's just as much as that education that you have to spend with the end user, you have to spend with the partner to understand what is it that is that magic moment for the partner's user that's going to get them to be interested and engaged. And if you have that, then that partnership can be magic because then both partners are excited, their users are excited, and that can kind of create the flywheel to get things going. Okay. Um, I think one part of partnerships is figuring out uh, what your customers need. Um, so I know, Declan? Declan? Okay. Declan talked about, uh, you know, listening to your customers. And um, <clears throat> so before I was here at Unstoppable, I was with Amazon Web Services. And we believe very strongly in customer obsession. What do your customers want? You're not just doing something that's Web3, because Web3 is cool or AI is cool, but you're doing it because your customer needs it. And so a lot of our partnerships, we look for places that our customers are saying, we really need this. So for example, we partnered with a company called Webacy. Um, if you don't know Webacy, they do basically reputation. And so on our, our profile, our customers said, we want to know how safe it is to work with these particular other consumers. And so we partnered with Webacy to fill that gap where we now have a, a safe, safest uh, rating system or reputation score on the profile. Um, we partnered up with Matt and XMTP because our users were looking for a way to communicate with each other. Uh, so, you know, Telegram could be difficult. Discord, a lot of people don't like Discord. And so, you know, we have, what, 32,000 different ways to communicate. And so we embedded and integrated XMTP because our customers wanted a way to communicate with each other. And so now they can do that real easy using uh, domain to domain. We have 3.9 million um, identity holders out there, and now any of them can communicate with each other. So those partnerships are really about filling a gap that our customer has told us that they're looking and they need. Um, and then other partnerships are really more about filling a gap for that partner. Uh, so for example, when we partnered with Pudgy Penguins, they were looking for a digital identity. For example, we announced today that you can use sandy.pudgy to log into their new game, Pudgy World. So they were looking for that identity platform. Um, the same thing was true for .Austin. The city of Austin was looking to showcase their innovation and looking for a way to drink their own champagne, teach 
their citizens about being on chain without just having them take classes, having them use it. And so for each of these, we look at you know, different things to fill a gap in our product based on what our customers want or to help our partner meet their needs as they move forward. Excellent. Declan, did you want to Yeah, I was just going to add, like, because for Linear is quite unique. It's a network. So without our partners, we are really nothing. Like, it's just block space. It's an underlying infrastructure. Like, our job is essentially to empower those that build on top of Linear to be successful. And that, in turn, helps to build our success. And so for me, it's, like, really about identifying those sorts of partners and communities which are there for the same mission as Linear and sort of value aligned, but also there to build, you know, durable communities and use cases that are going to bring more people on chain, that are going to last 10, 50, 100 years into the future, like sort of serious projects and communities. Um, I think Shama was on here before from eFrogs, which is a native community built on Linear. You know, started from scratch as an NFT project, and now it's kind of turned into an economic powerhouse where they've been able to sort of coordinate capital in a way to, you know, take out investments. And so to kind of see that community grow from scratch, like, you know, from our perspective as Linear is like truly amazing. And so, yeah, for us, the partnerships are pretty much everything. Yes. So I'll, I'll take the, the opposite uh, for us. I mean, probably, honestly, obviously, I'm a community maxi uh, because we built a community first company. Uh, we are strong believers that our target audience, which are Web3 marketers and growth leaders, uh, they really need three things to grow in um, their jobs and their careers. It's knowledge, network, and technology. And we are a technology platform uh, first and foremost, but people, uh, all of you in the room, probably also need network and knowledge. Um, and that is something that community can very uniquely deliver that technology, in my opinion, never will be able to deliver. Um, and so within our community, uh, we uh, are proactively matching members together uh, with each other so that they can build their own network with fellow peers and, and really learn knowledge from them. Um, we uh, believe strongly, and I think that a lot of communities miss this fact, is that uh, a community, in my opinion, is not a real community unless people know each other personally in that community. And so for us to be able to foster this interconnectedness, I meet every single person one-on-one -on -one that joins our community, and then I use the information that I learned from them to match them with the person that I think would be the most valuable person for them to meet in this moment. And we've now been doing this for two and a half years. I've met over 400 growth leaders, and I think that this is really the only way to build a true uh, and lasting community is to drive these one-on-one -on -one relationships that will stand the test of time. Um, a great example of this, since they were just on this stage, is that we had uh, Casey and Grace, uh, who are both the Web3 Web social founders. Uh, they joined our community in the, in the last batch, and we matched them together, as I thought that there were two really compelling people that should meet each other. Um, so we do this every time. So I think that, uh, in conclusion, community is the thing that really drives the adoption of our platform and our technology, um, and partnerships uh, is not something that we think about at all, to be honest. Well, we have different perspectives. It's always great. So as we look into the future, what are some emerging trends that you see coming? How do you see it impacting growth? Do you see more challenges, more opportunities, a bit of both? Anybody want to, Sandy, do you have thoughts? Um, so obviously AI, right? You guys have heard about AI, right? Okay. Um, I think AI is really fascinating because Given the gaps that I see in AI, I think it's actually going to accelerate the growth of blockchain. Um, and let me tell you why I think that. You know, if you look right now, 49% of the world's population will be in an election this year. 49%, the largest population that we've ever seen in one year go through an election. The number one thing that they're worried about is deep fakes that are coming out of AI. Like, how do I know that this is really the candidate? Or how do I know this was really their picture? Or how do I know this was really their quote? And so blockchain can help validate, have that trusted verification uh, for something that's said, or a video that's made, or a picture that was out there. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Did you guys see the Pope in his Balmain uh, puffer jacket? Um, Three million people retweeted that, and it turned out it was done as an AI exercise, seeing if they could fool people. Um, and then two weeks before that, I had been on the red carpet, and it was cold in Los Angeles. It's not supposed to be cold in Los Angeles. I had a puffer jacket on with my long dress, and people started wondering, was my picture also deep fake? 
I didn't get three million hits, unfortunately. But um, they were wondering the same thing. So I was able, through my digital identity, to provide like a pink check mark that showed this was a picture that was real, was a real picture that was validated by a real person on the blockchain. And so I do think that artificial intelligence is going to continue to grow. It'll be like the hottest trend for quite some time. And I think it will accelerate blockchain because of the value that blockchain can bring to the table. Anyone? Matt? I, maybe I'm crazy in this, but everything that we do in here still is bleeding edge to most people. Uh, and I don't know that we can really get super excited about all of the things that are still yet to come, still in that hopper, unless we've actually done the job of getting the things that we've already done to really be uh, truly felt, truly used, and all those things. I mean, just to uh, to use blockchain as an example, the idea that we have these identities and that I can just sign something and say, I did this, and the only way that, that uh, only proof that you need is that is that signature right there. And we've got other proving technologies and things like that that are on the way. That's absolutely huge and can fundamentally change so many different aspects of, of, of business and transactions and all of these things that go well beyond just the financial world. But that is something that we all take for granted and that's been around for ages. And so I think to know where we can go next, it is always still worth it to kind of keep in mind the things that we are actually taking for granted today because we're living so far in the future that we kind of have to, you know, uh, remember <laughs> where, where, where we've come from. Yeah, I think from an infrastructure perspective, we've definitely had a few milestones recently which, you know, really kind of unlock a lot of like new use cases from a growth perspective. You know, for Linear now, you can actually process, you know, thousands of transactions at a very fast pace at a very low cost. And you still do this by inheriting security from Ethereum for a cost of only something like a tenth of a cent per L2 transaction. And so now you can start to think of like growth tactics and new use cases that weren't really possible before. Um, we're also able to focus on new technologies and ways to improve interoperability. So sort of a big criticism recently on the infrastructure side is you have a lot of these different chains, these L2s, Ethereum, how's it gonna compete with Solana? Um, and I think like one way that we've, we've at least been approaching this is like how can we improve the interoperability? You know, us at Linear, we've, been, we've got a ZK team, we've been focused on ways to sort of do cross-chain ZK. And I think that from a growth perspective and a user experience perspective is we'll be able to create a seamless user experience between these chains. So again, when you go to use an application, you interface with the application, the sort of back-end infrastructure feels very much like Web2, where it just sort of, you know, guides and abstracts that whole sort of experience and complexity. So I think, you know, sort of like trends that are emerging are still on the technology side. We're still very early and there's still a lot to unlock just in the sort of like the, you know, the guardrails and the ground. Yeah. I think one of the trends that I see emerging most is uh, social apps as the messaging layer. I think that that is one um, area that uh, we've seen, at least in the growth space, is there's always been a way to understand and analyze your users on chain, uh, but then how do you message them, right? How do you get, get in touch with them? And I feel like there haven't been that many places where you can actually have a user receive a message, right? Uh, but social applications, especially ones like Farcaster that are emerging where real Web3 users actually hang out, is an inbox that you can actually reach those users on. So I think that this is a big game changer for growth of um, having a place where users uh, like all of us, uh, not just the bots, actually hang out and can be reached. Um, that will drive a lot of growth. Yeah. I think we're about time. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Can I have one question? Yeah, cool. Uh, so, like, like, use that. There you are. Oh, that's like, use that sound. Keep quiet. And the microphone. Oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah, I'm just wondering. Um, you speak a lot about uh, usability and ease of access. Uh, I think you guys have done some amazing job, especially given that you're operating um, decentralized object. Where do you see it going in the future? But where do you come to? Do you, is there any kind of plan to out to make it even more user friendly and ease of access to those on to blue dump on web three? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. You know, one of our uh, one of the clients, Converse, the founder of Converse, Paul. His his core thing through the entire time that he uh, you know had been work, has been working on Converse is the idea that my family needs to be able to sign up and it needs to be 
so easy and seamless and nothing different than what they would be experiencing, perhaps even better than what they're experiencing in, in Web2. And so once we've been able to reach that level, uh, and I would say there's a lot of reasons to believe that we're pretty close to that, then the onboarding of those users is pretty easy. From that point, it's how do you actually take all these wonderful Web3 primitives that have been, uh, have been developed, uh, the sort of benefit of the smart contracts we can come up with and things like being able to have uh, you know, uh, cross-border payments and all of this stuff, and then how do you take that and abstract it to the point where it's just a, a message you know, it's a frame that sits inside of a message, uh, and it's just a handful of clicks or a few, uh, a few reactions, and you get that benefit of whatever that thing is, but we're not having to go all the way into, uh, you know, a wallet to play with that or onto a wallet-enabled browser or whatever, but it's just a very natural experience. And I think we're, we're actually really close. I mean, sub one year from being able to really say that that can be an experience that can be enabled by something in Web3. Thank you. And that closes our panel. Thank you so much to our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you.